Hi. So now we've got a bit of a handle on how to differentiate a function, how do we use this to solve anything in particular? Well, let's use our differential of x squared that we derived in episode 1 to be 2x. We know that this means at any point in x, the function x squared is increasing by 2x for every change of one unit in x. However, we know the gradient is not constant, as we can see in this graph of x squared and this gradient. So if we try to see how much x squared increases by an interval, just by multiplying the gradient of 2x by the interval length, we won't get the correct answer. Take, for example, the points x equal 5 and x equal 7, where we want to find out how much x squared is increasing this interval. Well, if we just multiply the gradient by the interval length, we'll get 4x. Setting x equal 5, we get x squared is increased by 20. But we see how much is actually increased by 7 squared is 49, 5 squared is 25, so 49 minus 25 equals 24. So it's increased by 24, where we predict it only increases by 20. So how do we actually use a differential of function to tell us how the function changes at point? We have to work out how the function changes over an interval. Well, if we decrease the length of the interval, we should find that we get closer to the answer, as the gradient will have changed less than the length of our interval for a smaller interval, and the closer to what it was at the point we differentiated. So on the percentage difference between the actual answer and our gradient multiplied by the interval length for different interval lengths about the point x equal 5 is shown here. So we can see that as the interval gets smaller, our answer gets closer to the true answer. Well let's try rewriting the calculation of a large interval as a sum of calculations of lots of small intervals for the, func for the general function dx, which we'll say is the derivative of the function fx. So we can get the change in the interval of length 1 starting at point a by calculating the differential at that point and multiplying it by 1. Then for length 2, we do the same, so then add the differential at point a plus 1, multiply by 1. And then for length 3, we do the same, add the differential at point a plus 2, multiply by 1. Then to go all the way to point b, we continue doing this for every term up to b minus 1. Now we can see this is a better approximation for large intervals. For instance, for the interval of length 2 of x squared, that we calculated before, from x equals 5 to x equals 7, we can do this and we'll find we get 2 times 5 times 1, which is 10 plus 2 times 6 times 1, which is 12. So 10 plus 12 equals 22, which is 92% of the true answer of 24, rather than 83% that we got before. But it's still only an approximation. So let's rewrite this with instead of the interval of 1, with just an interval of length L, getting this equation. But now how many terms are in this summation? Well, we'll rewrite point B as A plus some interval H. Every term covers the length of L, so the total length covered is the number of terms, n minus 1, multiplied by L. The minus 1 is where we count n equals 1 at point A, which covers no distance, not at point A plus L. So let's introduce some new notation to shorten this large sum. This squiggly line is the Greek letter sigma, and just means sum. The bit underneath it is what it's saying to start at, and the bit at the top is saying what to end at, increasing the variable that's divided underneath by 1 each time. So to rewrite this just as a long sum of terms, you start by inputting i equal 1 into the equation, then add it to the equation for i equal 2, then i equal 3, and so on until i equals n, which you can see is equivalent to the long sum we wrote out before. So using the distributed property, you can bring l out in front of the summation, and just multiply it by every term, and in front of the i minus 1. You can then rewrite the summation as starting from i equals 0, and ending at n minus 1, but rewriting i minus 1 as just i. As i minus 1 starting at i equals 1, it's just i shifted over by 1 from starting at 0. Then rewriting l equals h over n, as shown earlier, we get this equation. Now if this tends to the correct answer as the number of terms becomes larger, let's take the limit as n tends to infinity and just bring h out, out to the front. Now as shown earlier, as n tends to infinity, this tends toward the correct answer. Remembering that the function dx is a differential of fx, we've now found a way to go from a differential of a function to figuring out how much the function has changed by. This is a useful thing to do, and it's called the integral of the function. The symbol for integration is this long s, with the letter b at the top indicates the upper point integrated to, the letter b at the bottom indicates the lower point the integration was started from. So how do we actually solve this equation? Well, let's try solving this particularly for the case dx equals 2x, the differential of x squared. We get this after substituting in dx equals 2x. As 2 is multiplied by every term of the sum, we can bring it outside the sum, still multiplying every term. Now there are two sums inside our summations, so we can split these off into two summations. Now the h of ren is multiplied by every term of the second summation, so we can bring this out to the front. And the first summation is just a constant term multiplied, repeatedly added to itself n times. 
This is the definition of multiplying by n. For instance, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is just 2 multiplied by 3. So we can rewrite the first summation as a multiplied by n. Now distribute the 1 over n that's multiplied by both terms across both summations to get rid of the n multiplied by a. Now the final summation is just summing up the natural numbers, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, etc., all the way up to n minus 1. Let's write this out as such. Now from this you can see that every term at the start can be matched up to, to a term at the end to give n. 1 plus n minus 1 is n, 2 plus n minus 2 is n, 3 plus n minus 3 is n, 4 plus n minus 4 is n, add infinite. This again is just a definition of multiplying n by the number of n's we have. Well, when we paired up the numbers, we halved the number of terms we had, and we originally had n terms, so now we have n over 2 terms. Therefore, this sum is equal to n squared over 2. Putting this back in the summation from earlier, we get this. We can see the n squared cancel, so now we can get this equation. Since there's no n's in this, the limit is n terms to infinity, it's just a function without any limits on n. So here is the integral of 2x, which we can use the example of at the point 8 with 5, with interval length of h equal 2, to see that this gives the correct answer. Since as we showed before, x squared changes by 24 between x equal 5 and x equal 7, and using this integral we get 24 for how much x squared should have changed by. So rewriting dx just directly as a differential of fx, we show that the differential of a function integrated is just a change in the function between the upper and lower limits of the integral, which we donate with this straight line. However, as the differential of a constant term is zero, the constant term doesn't change, so differential which is its rate of change is zero. When integrating without any limits, we can get the function originally differentiated plus a constant term, since after differentiating any constant term will be lost, shown by this equation. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus and is an incredibly useful and important result.